Hello and welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I am your host, Olga Peters, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. I am joined this week by regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, who's one of three representatives from the town of Brattleboro. Hello, Emily. Good morning, Olga. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. And welcome back to the show, Sarah Copeland Hansas, who is running for Secretary of State. And um, so glad you can join us today to talk about uh, that office. And um, we'll be talking a little bit about elections today. If folks don't know Sarah, she is a member of the House. She is the current chair of GovOps, what what we call GovOps, but is government operations, which I think is an interesting uh, committee. If you don't mind, Sarah, I know um, we hadn't really talked about talking about this, but I'd love if you would tell us a little bit about GovOps and why it's such a, it it feels like such a crucial committee in many ways. It is, uh, it is a a very broad ranging committee. Uh, We, we cover a lot of material from local government issues to anything related to the functioning of state government uh, to oversight of the secretary of state's office, including elections and um, state archives and, and uh, corporations and office of professional regulation. Uh, And we get occasionally uh, miscellaneous bills. For instance, um, you know, cannabis wasn't specifically under the jurisdiction of the government operations committee until we moved forward with a cannabis tax and regulate um, system. And so that bill came to the government operations committee. So uh, we also did pension reform because as oversight of state government, we um, pension issues fall under our jurisdiction. Um, And uh, municipal charters take up a lot of our time. And Mm -hmm. uh, of course, this past uh, year in 2022, redistricting took up a Mm. big time. Thank you, Sarah. You know, there are so many ways that folks can serve their communities from volunteering for a local organization to, you know, serving on the select board to being a library trustee. Um, For you, why have you chosen elected office as your way of serving the community? Well, um, I I think I have to go back to what made me run in the first place, um, and uh, and that was that as a teacher, um, I was really uh, angered by something that one of my predecessors had said about public education and the role of public education, because uh, to me, our teachers are our community heroes because. Uh, because our schools are the opportunity that every kid has to advance themselves and to uh, to, to learn and grow. Um, and uh, one of my predecessors had made some disparaging remarks about schools. And I thought, we, you know, that's not how we feel in Bradford Fairley and West Fairley. We should have somebody in Montpelier who actually stands up for and respects our public schools and our teachers. Um, and so I, I ran for office for that and other reasons as well. Um, and once I got there, you know, just the understanding that my role was to talk to my people at home, you know, in line at the grocery store, after church on Sunday, at the sidelines of a ball game, find out what they're concerned about, hear their ideas, and then take those ideas and concerns and talk to folks in Montpelier about it and see if we can fix the things that aren't working well, see if we can implement those new cool ideas and then gather information about what everybody else in the legislature is doing because, you know, there's 14 different committees and there's two different chambers and there's lots going on, but to try to keep tabs on all of that and then bring it back home to my community so that my community can understand more than just what you might see or hear in a headline. Thank you, Sarah. Emily, we have talked about elections on Mm -hmm. the show before. In fact, current uh, Secretary of State Jim Condos has been on the the show to talk to us about some measures Vermont's taken to protect elections. For you as as a lawmaker, 
what is it about um, elections? How do I want to say this? I think we all agree that elections need to be fair and open. But for you, what what is that definition of fair and open? What does that look like? Well, and I have not gotten to answer this question that all the candidates have been answering. Um, but I would, you know, it's sort of wrapped up in that for me. Um, if we really believe in democracy and the sense of small town democracy that's really important to Vermonters, then voting needs to feel possible. Um, it needs to be sort of a regular part of our lives. It needs to be sort of woven into the fabric. And so when I hear from folks that they didn't vote at one point or another, or another, they don't understand why they would vote, which happens a lot when I was knocking on, when I'm knocking on doors. Um, I understand that there was a period when I didn't vote. I think it's why we don't vote that matters and what we do about that fact on the other side that matters. And so I felt really disenfranchised from government. I felt really disenfranchised from how government was able to serve me. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of people I spoke, I've spoken with. And so I think there's a lot that we can do in terms of open elections um, and fair elections that bring more people into the process of democracy. I think competitive primaries matter. I think being able to vote right at the ballot box, like really being able to register right at the ballot box the way we have in Vermont matters. I think being able to fix your mistakes, cure your ballot matters. And I think all of those things are what make a difference in terms of this being like a normal thing that you do versus this like bureaucratic hellscape of being able to check the boxes or take a standardized test or all of these things that are sort of already wrapped up in people's experience of contemporary capitalism that feels so alienating. Um, and so for me, that's why sort of open and fair elections matter on a basic level. I think there's like lots of questions about the strength of our democracy in America and all these things that I'm sure we're gonna get into and Sarah has a lot to say about. But like for me at the very basic level, it has to be easy enough that it's not a burden on the humans who are doing it. And one of the things that I, you know, we've talked so much on the show for the last few years about the pandemic and the lessons from the pandemic and like, what can we learn from this? And will we learn anything from this? Are we all just gonna go back to the same miserable situation we were in before? And this is one of the places where we learned from the pandemic we did good during the pandemic and we are maintaining that goodness into the future. And I love that. How about for, for you, Sarah, what, what do free and open elections look like for you? And where do you feel, I know Vermont's done a lot of work in this area, but, but where do we need to go next? Um, so I think that Emily hit the nail on the head about um, if we uh, if we want to be able to be in a democracy, we need to make sure that voting is not a burden for people. Um, and the balance to that is making sure that we uh, that we know that our elections are are safe and fair and accessible. That uh, that that they are being conducted uh, to the letter of the law. And that's been a lot of what we've done in terms of oversight um, of elections while I've been chair of government operations is just asking those questions, kicking the tires, saying, is, is, is this working the way we intended it to work? Um, the, 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 the mindset that I bring into this is, uh, is one of listening to my constituents as I have for 18 years in the house. And so there would be times when I would, you know, go door knocking and, you know, and I'd have a great conversation with somebody. And at the end of the conversation, I'd say, so the election is such and such a date. Can I count on your vote? Oh, no, I don't vote, people would say, you know, and 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 enough people said that that I, I started you know, really asking deeper questions of, well, well, why don't you vote? Well, I don't know any of the people on the ballot. And I'm thinking, well, you know me, because we just had a good, <laughs> great conversation about all of these different issues. Um, um, and so, you know, when I think about election reforms going forward, one of the things that I want to make sure of, as Emily said, make it easy so that it's not a burden. Um, I want to create a voter guide so that when you get your November ballot in the mail, you also get a postcard with a URL uh, for the website that has the voter guide. And you can also uh, request a paper copy because we know that 
unfortunately, some people still don't have adequate internet to be able to do these things online. But that voter guide could be produced um, right away because it's information that we all have to submit as candidates when we uh, when we mm -hmm. sign our consent to candidate form. And so all of that information could be made possible, uh, could be made uh, available to people to be able to look up at the candidate's website, look up their social media, find their contact information if you have a specific question that you want to ask someone. Because, you know, the media can only cover what the media can cover. And that's usually the top races, you know, the congressional and the, the governor and and lieutenant governor. And then by the time you get down to like Emily and me running as state representative, it's sometimes hard to find more than one or maybe two articles during a campaign season about a local um, state representative race. So that voter guide will go a long way, I think, to making, making the best use of that 45 day window that you have your general election ballot to, to for, for you to just be able to sit down at your kitchen table and and look through all of the candidates and decide for yourself who cl most closely matches uh, what you'd like to see state government look like. Thank you. Um, and what what is your thought or what are your thoughts on um, are there new policies we need to enact around elections to to either make access easier or maybe uh, fill in gaps where, where we still have gaps to access. Because it's one thing, um, you know, I, I, I'll back up. I think one thing that's interesting about elections is they're many faceted because you need the information to choose the candidate, but then you also need to have the time and the energy to get to a polling place or request a ballot or, you know, somehow get that ballot in your hands. And there, those are all different parts of the process. Um, and I, I sometimes feel they need different approaches. I don't know if, how either of you feel about that. Um, so yeah, so when it comes to access, are there places we, we need to improve or are we doing okay? Uh, there's definitely things that we can do better. Um, and we have been making these changes slowly over time, incrementally, uh, in part because our elections are administered on the local level by 245, 250 local town clerks, um, who many of whom are sort of a one person show. You know, a lot of our small towns, the clerk doesn't have uh, staff and he or she is open, you know, a couple of days a week um, and maybe doesn't have the flexibility to be able to say, oh, I, you know, I need to pull in a, a temporary person to come and help me administer these new elections procedures. So we've been a adapting these over time and really listening to our local elections administrators to make sure that we're giving them what they need. But there are a couple things that we can do moving forward that I think will um, expand people's access to the ballot box um, and not be overly burdensome to our, uh, our to our local elections officials, the town clerks. Um, First of all, I want to talk about automatic voter registration because we <clears throat> we enacted uh, automatic voter registration back in 2015, 2016. And that is you go to the Department of Motor Vehicles, you get your driver's license and the DMV automatically um, exchanges that information with uh, with the secretary of state's office so that you can get added to the voter checklist. Um, if you move from one town to another and go and change your driver's license, that also would get automatically updated. But there are a lot of people who either are living in Vermont uh, or are or moved to Vermont who don't ever intend to get a driver's license. If you mm -hmm. are disabled, uh, if you are older, um, you, you wouldn't necessarily go to the, the DMV for a driver's license. And so we asked the Secretary of State's office to collaborate with um, different agencies of state government, because some of those folks, uh, if they're disabled or if they're elderly, um, might be interacting with state government in different ways. And so we want to make sure that in, in every way that somebody might interact with state government, that that is an opportunity to, uh, to add them to the voter checklist so that uh, an you know, an older person moves to Vermont, perhaps to, you know, to live with their adult children in, the, in their waning years, 
gets automatically added to the voter rolls because we want those people to be able to participate. So expanding automatic voter registration is a really good start. Then I want to talk a little Wait, bit. Can, about I add, can I add something to that, Sarah? So I folks might not be aware of this, but Vermont for quite a while has um, not just enabled folks with felony records to vote, which is actually quite unusual, but also folks who are currently incarcerated can vote. However, they might not have a driver's license because you don't have much of a use for a driver's license when you're incarcerated. Mm, true. Um, and the institution that you're living in, the prison, um, might not actually be all that interested in supporting you to vote. And so that's another one of the places where it's less a change in law and more sort of a change in policy and procedure that we need to make in order to expand an existing right into something that actually happens for people. Yeah. Thank you. Because, because it's really empowering for people to be able to cast their ballot. And when, you know, when, when you are able to participate in democracy, that, that gives you the feeling that you have the ability to, to change something moving forward. And, and so I think of this in terms of, you know, expanding voting to younger people, as well as to making sure that people who are incarcerated, who will come out and want to rejoin our communities. Uh, let's, let's get these folks uh, active and make sure that they feel connected to, to their community and able to influence their government. And so, um, let's talk a little bit about getting ballots in people's hands. So we made universal vote by mail permanent after the very successful uh, 2020 election um, for the general election. So for the November election every year, uh, every other year, because we do our general elections on even years, um, you'll get a general election ballot in the mail automatically to the address that, that you are <coughs> registered at. Um, we didn't expand that to the primary yet. And again, this is one of those where we're taking it one step at a time to make sure that our, um, our local elections administrators feel comfortable with it. So right now, if you want to vote in the August 9th primary this year, you have three ways to do it. You can walk to your walk into your town clerk's office and say, I would like to vote in the primary. And he or she will check you off the checklist, hand you a ballot, you can fill it in um, and take it, you know, turn it right back in there uh, and boom, you're done. Uh, you can also call the municipal office and ask to have your ballot mailed to you, uh, keeping in mind that it's been a little less predictable how long something takes to, uh, to, to be mailed out. Um, when the municipal clerk mails it out to you, then you can fill it out and either drop it back at the drop box because so many town clerks now have these wonderful uh, elections drop boxes, uh, or you can pop it back in the mail, but please make sure you do that in enough time that the well, it makes it back to the town clerk's office before um, August 9th. Uh, and then the third way is to go to your My Voter page on the Secretary of State's website, and you can fill out a form there, and they will prompt your town clerk to send you uh, your ballot in the mail. So if you like doing things online and you, uh, and you don't want to call or go see your, your town clerk in person, you can do it on your My Voter page. So Putting that ballot in people's hands for the primary, I think we should probably move forward with doing that automatically. But there's a few challenges to it because when you're voting by mail, there's a particular order that you have to return your ballots in. And in the primary, you get three ballots because we have a three party system. And so the, the potential for people to incorrectly uh, return those ballots and have them um, discarded because of an error on the part of the voter uh, is one of the reasons why we, we wanted to slow down. Another reason is because there's a tremendous amount of postage involved and printing costs involved to, uh, you know, to present to print, you know, 100, 200, 300,000 copies of three different primary ballots. And so we're going to have a conversation with Vermonters about how to move forward with this, because I do think it's important for people to, uh, to, to have it as easy as possible to vote. Uh, but the fact of the matter is a primary is a party contest. And there are a lot of people who just simply don't identify with a party. And so that's why 
the turnout in primary voting is so much lower than the turnout in the general election. So again, we don't wanna mail out 300,000 copies of three different ballots knowing that you know a small portion of people are gonna actually vote in that election. Yeah, I so would- can, um, oh. can, I? can I ask a, a kind of a stupid question? And it's probably very evident to everyone who does elections, but so in Vermont, we, we have open primaries. You don't have to declare a party to vote. And I realize um, the primaries are, are important to the parties, but since the voter does not have to declare a party, why can't we have one ballot? Like, why do we need three different party ba ballots in the oh, primary? Oh, and you can only vote on... You can can only execute one ballot. So you can't, for instance, say, ooh, the, you know, the governor's primary is really interesting over here. So I'm going to vote on this ballot, but the, you know, the Secretary of State's primary is really interesting over here. So I'm going to vote on that. So um, it, it's an interesting question. There are states who do more of an open primary system. Um, and uh, I think in that situation, uh, that would be a longer conversation of really educating Vermonters. To say, do we do you know? Do we ask you to declare which <laughs> which party you wish to vote in, uh, in order to eliminate having to mail three ballots, or do we do do we shift gears altogether and go to more of an open primary system? It it's a legitimate conversation to have. Um, I suspect that the parties would prefer to have their own enclosed you know, the, you know, this is the contest that we as Democrats or we as progressives or we as Republicans are having to decide who our best candidates are going to be. So that's really the point of the primaries. Hmm. Okay, thank you. I was talking to a constituent um, the other day and she had recently moved here. And I think this was, I don't know, maybe her first or second time voting here. And she had received her primary, but she'd asked for and received her primary ballot in the mail and was so beyond yeah. confused about it. I mean, really just, she had no idea what was going on. She had no idea why she had received all these ballots. She'd moved from somewhere that you did not, did not have sort of the multiple primary system. Um, and I think even people who are used to going to the town clerk's office and getting their ballot, the clerk asks you which ballot you want. The clerk does not hand you all three ballots. And so it was really, um, it's quite a confusing shift for people. And I remember even two years ago, I, rec I recorded a video explaining how to vote in the primary. And that even the process of like trying to explain it to people was confusing because there were so many different pieces of paper all in a pile in front of me. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I want to put a plug in for one ballot and, and tell the parties to... Um... Suck it up. Yeah. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Um, so there's one other um, there's one other sort of forward looking reform that I would like to enact um, uh, that will help people to participate in democracy. And, and this is another thing that that comes back to the many conversations that I've had with my neighbors over the years uh, as I've been running. Um, and so one of the other reasons that people give when they uh, when they say that they're not voting is my vote doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I don't trust that my vote will even be counted. And um, and so to that, there's a couple different ways of answering that. One, I have participated in recounts that were decided by, uh, you know, by less than a handful of votes. And so, yes, your vote actually does matter uh, in a lot of races, in a lot of places. And, um, but the other part of it, the, I don't trust the, that my vote is going to be counted, really cries for uh, for a, a more robust civics education and engagement with Vermonters. So there used to be an education and outreach coordinator position when Deb Markowitz was Secretary of State, and that position was eliminated when Jim Condos took over. And so I want to reinstate that position because I think that that person should be someone who's getting out into the communities, creating curriculum material for our teachers um, so that they can incorporate how to participate in democracy into their lessons in, in the way that we used to when Deb Markowitz was Secretary of State. Um, 
making this material available will vastly increase the likelihood that teachers are um, engaging in uh, in some civics education uh, as they're working on their social studies curriculum. And, uh, and it will also help to, um, to, to make that misinformation and disinformation that we're hearing about the safety and security of elections less likely to take hold. You know, if elections are a black box and you have no idea how they're conducted and who's looking who's doing oversight and how do we know that our elections are safe, then you can be much more susceptible to that kind of misinformation. This education and outreach coordinator is going to be a busy, busy person. And I will be right alongside with him or her to get out into the communities and really help people understand how democracy works so that they feel more empowered to participate. Thank you, Sarah. Hey, Emily, we have just a couple minutes before the end of this first segment. Anything, uh, any questions for Sarah or anything you want to leave listeners with? Well, I just sort of two other pieces of um, enfranchisement um, that are sort of important to me that I've been working on myself and Sarah has been a really great champion of them um, that I think are worth naming is the Brattleboro Youth Vote, our charter change, um, which we have passed in the house multiple times. Um, and then managed to pass in the Senate once and the governor vetoed. And well, I think we all know what happened from there. But I, you know, when I've talked to folks about it, again, this is less about sort of the individual vote of each individual youth, which is powerful, but it's more as really a tool of helping youth understand how this works, helping them practice, helping them learn the process, helping them feel like their voice matters, helping them feel like they're part of the community. And so that's a really powerful piece of work that I'm gonna interested in keeping on working on. Um, and I don't remember the Secretary of State ever really piping in on that conversation previously, um, but I think Sarah has been in the trenches on that one. So I look forward to her jumping in on it if she is elected. And then the other one, is making um, election day a state holiday, mm -hmm. which is, um, sounds like a brilliant, easy idea on the face of it. And then there's this really interesting piece that all of our state holidays are like very carefully programmed into our union contract. And there are mm -hmm. already state holidays very, very close to election day. And so there's a question about like, does another holiday go away and who has feelings about that holiday going away or like all of that. So I think that's sort of another, um, another piece that is, again, it's about drawing attention to this thing and celebrating it as a community and talking about it as a community so that we all, this all becomes just sort of a regular rhythm of our lives. You know, no one forgets about Christmas, even if they want to. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Um, thank, you, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Sarah. We are going to take a quick break here on the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station, to hear from some of our underwriters. But stay tuned. We shall return. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you're just joining us, I am your host, Olga Peters, and I'm speaking with regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, one of three reps from the town of Brattleboro, as well as Secretary of State candidate, Sarah Copeland Hansas, who is also a member of the House and has served for um, many years there and is the current chair of the Government Operations Committee as well. Um, you can find the Montpelier Happy Hour on BCTV, as well as our podcast and our Facebook page, Emily's YouTube channel, and of course, our webpage, the Montpelier Happy Hour .fm. Whew. Emily, what do we Hello. need to remind listeners of? Well, the views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests separately from each other, and not the stations, nor the platforms, nor the employers, nor families, nor pets of the people speaking. Thank you. Thank you. So before the break, we were talking about elections, and we talked a lot about access to elections. And I'm curious, uh, Sarah, 
we have heard on the national stage a lot of concerns around um, election tampering, election fraud. And, and I think for many people, it's kind of eroded their trust in the system. I'm wondering for you, how do you see Vermont's role in this bigger conversation? Yeah, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of work that we can do to help Vermonters understand how our elections work here in Vermont and how it is that we can check in to make sure that we know our elections are safe and secure and fair. Um, you know, Vermont has the blessing of having, you know, 246 local elections administrators for a population that's roughly the size of Boston. And so when you look at um, overseeing elections, the people who are sworn in and have a, uh, a vested duty to execute our elections safely and fairly are very close to the people that, uh, that they are overseeing. Uh, you know, your, your local town clerk with 800 or 1,000 or a couple thousand um, uh, voters is is really close to her constituents or his constituents, and they know uh, how to administer that checklist, how to make sure that people who don't belong on the checklist are removed from the checklist, um, and they take very seriously the procedures on elections on election day to check to make sure that it's being executed correctly. And so, you know, I I hearken back to 2020, which was a high turnout level for the state of Vermont, the highest in decades. Um, and we had reports from those local elections administrators of seven instances of, hey, something doesn't look right here. Six of those were investigated and it was found to be just human error in checking in the checklist. So somebody was supposed to check off John P. Smith and instead they checked off John Q. Smith. And so when, you know, when both John Smiths came to vote, uh, you know, we, we had to figure out which John Smith hasn't had a ballot yet. Um, and the seventh instance of elections irregularity was found to be somebody who had intentionally tested the system and he had executed his absentee ballot and mailed it in and then showed up on election day and demanded a ballot from his local town clerk and the town clerk, I think it was uh, South Burlington, um, said, okay, I see that you've already voted. So here's the affidavit that you need to fill out swearing that you have not yet executed a ballot. And that's the system that we have in place to get a little bit more information anytime something seems a little bit unusual so that afterward the, the clerk can unravel that, try to figure out how that happened, report it to the Secretary of State's office. The Secretary of State's office reports to the Attorney General's office if there's in an investigation that needs to happen. And that's one of the ways that we make sure that we have uh, safe and fair elections because we've got you know nearly 250 uh, sets of eyes out there watching over our elections. So Emily, we often talk on this show about uh, the stories that create policy or the stories mm -hmm. under policy. When it comes to fair, open elections, trustworthy elections, what are some of the stories you hear from constituents when you are out and about? So what I hear from constituents here when I'm out and about is trust in our election process. You know, everyone, I saw something on Twitter that I don't remember the details of, but it was basically like there are more justices of the peace in Vermont than like something. I don't remember what it was, but basically like everyone knows someone who's somehow involved in something at your voting location. And I'm sure that's even more true in towns smaller than Brattleboro. Um, and I know that, you know, sort of everyone in town knows what our town clerk's like favorite hot beverage is and brings her one on election day. You know, like it's all very, very personal. Um, and I think that makes it feel safer and more trustworthy. And so what I do hear is sort of further Vermont exceptionalism that we have it all figured out here, but over there, those people don't have it figured out. Over there, those people either don't trust in their elections or their elections aren't trustworthy or whatever it is, or the national elections, we can trust our local elections, but what happens to our national ballots? Mm -hmm. How does Vermont's voting matter in a national election? And so 
I'm curious sort of what, there are so many ways that sort of what Vermont does or doesn't do impacts the national landscape. And so I'm curious, Sarah, what, how you've thought about that, what we can do here um, that will make any dent in the sort of hellscape of the voter fraud conversation nationally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it's a great question and and you are correct that there that there is this sense that out there something awful and terrible must be happening. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think it's important for Vermonters to understand is that, you know, we're not doing anything that is radically new or different. Um, automatic voter registration was enacted in other places first. We looked at how it was enacted in other states. We looked at the protections that other states put in place. And then we compared that to Vermont's system because of the reality that our local elections administrators um, don't necessarily need the same kind of uh, verification process and hurdles indeed hurdles that uh, that people have to jump through in order to get registered to vote because your local town clerks probably know, oh, you're the family who just bought the Jones homestead. How are you liking, you know, the view uh, from the north side of, you know, from West Hill? And so, you know, <laughs> this gives us a, a, a more of a uh, an assurance that uh, that folks who are coming in to vote um, on that that automatic and same day voter registration are uh, are getting another set of checks. Um, the uh, the other thing that is important is that there is a, 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 an elections uh, checklist um, exchange system called the Eric system that makes sure that we can um, check for anyone who may have registered to vote in Vermont so that we can notify the state that they came from that, hey, these people are now Vermont residents. Um, and so those kinds of, uh, those kinds of local um, oversight can be overlain with this interstate oversight. So, you know, there, there are, I mean, are there other aspects of that, Emily, that you wanted to talk more about? Well, there's, you know, I, it strikes me as you're talking, this is sort of another place of Vermont being exceptional that on some level is a result of our whiteness. So, you know, we think about our very high homeowner rate here in Vermont, which we pride mm -hmm. ourselves in on. A lot of that is just sort of an accident of how few folks of color we have here who were sort of subject to redlining and the wealth gap and all of that post 1950s. And so we have this incredibly high homeowner rate because there weren't people who were disenfranchised from um, buying a home. And sort of similarly, we're able to have these like deeply vibrant, trusting access to the ballot box because everyone feels sort of very comfortable knowing each other and trusting each other and sort of accessing all of these things because we're all sort of one happy white family. Um, I am, when I think about what we're able to do here that I would love to see us be able to do nationally, it's that leap from, you know, the real voter fraud is that people are kept from voting who have a right to vote, right? It's that we have a majority of folks in some states who believe in one thing, and yet those other policies are enacted because so few people can access the ballot. Um, or people are being struck from voter checklists for things that aren't accurate or they don't deserve in other states. And so I'm wondering what we can do here to make a difference for those folks over there, which is sort of all I've been thinking about at all lately between, you know, the abortions and this, and just like the entire national landscape that feels terrifying while Vermont feels so good and safe. So yeah, like, yeah what so is your megaphone? What is the Secretary of State's megaphone and what can they do with it? So I would point to the National Association of Secretaries of State. Um, that is the organization uh, that is a nonpartisan uh, organization of secretaries of state from across the country, uh, some of whom uh, seem to be being intentionally infiltrated by elections deniers in other parts of the country. When you look at who's running for secretary of state, these are the people that may have been put forward by 
uh, for instance, a former president's uh, political organization, uh, in order to try to uh, put in place people who will overturn elections results going forward. Those people are, are, are going to get an earful <laughs> when I get to be a part of the National Association of Secretary of States. Because if you believe in democracy, you believe in people's right to vote. And it, you should not be putting these artificial barriers and hurdles in front of people who are uh, citizens of your state and have the right to choose their leaders. Um, I have some experience working on um, uh, interstate inter, um, state organizations that uh, that are are made up of folks from states that might think differently than Vermont. Uh, I was on the executive committee of the National Conference of State Legislatures for four years, and that's the same kind of organization where people come from red states and blue states. They come together in this nonpartisan organization to try to uh, be a convening for policies and best practices practices going forward. And so I have a lot of experience working in those environments with people who might feel very differently or think very differently than we do here in Vermont. Um, and, and I look forward to the opportunity to engage with secretaries of state from across the country because uh, I would challenge them to uh, to, to really uh, defend their, uh, their modes of disenfranchisement um, because it's really clearly undemocratic. Thank you, Sarah, and apologies to our listeners. There is a very big diesel truck sitting outside my apartment right now. I'm oh, running its engine. I hope your, <laughs> your window is closed. <laughs> yeah, if I suddenly like list over to one side. Um, you know, during the break, Sarah, you were, you talked about um, kind of how our, our election system has evolved, starting from same day voting to, uh, same day registration to, um, automatic registration, vote by mail, bye bye truck. Um, tell us more, more about that. Why, why was that a significant evolution in your mind? Um, so it's really been a process of, um, uh, of us looking at what other states are doing, seeing uh, what, what things other states are doing that are increasing the number or percentage of people who are voting, and then finding a way to adapt those things to the Vermont context. And, you know, as I have said before, the Vermont context is that we have very local elections administrators who, uh, you know, who are very close to the voters uh, who are voting in, in their town. Um, and that makes it very different than if you were enacting um, universal vote by mail in in, say, Colorado, where, uh, you know, where where you've got millions and millions of people uh, and and your local elections administrators can possibly know, you know, who lives where and uh, and who is actually a resident. So they have different levels of verification. Um, that that I think always need to be tested up against that principle that this is a democracy and everyone should have the opportunity to vote. So let's not put undue uh, hurdles in front of people. Um, so the evolution has been slow and, and a steady progress over the course of the last decade, really because of um, wanting to carefully vet the things that other states are doing and adapt them and also give our local elections administrators the time to engage in those conversations. As chair of government operations, you know, it is, it is always my first inclination to say, okay, you know, town clerks, what do you think about this proposal and how how will this proposal work? And sometimes there's pushback against that. You know, the, the ballot curing measures that we enacted when we made universal vote by mail permanent were at first very, um, very looked at very skeptically by town clerks because it does uh, it does put an extra burden on them. And so we had a back and forth dialogue about, OK, Here's the balance, burden on the local elections administrator versus not wanting somebody's ballot to be arbitrarily discounted as defective because they signed the, the outside envelope uh, on the wrong spot or neglected to fill out one of the, you know, one of the, the, the lines on the certification envelope. 
Um, and so being able to notify a voter that, hey, you know, your ballot was defective so that they can go in and, and correct that ballot, I think is really important um, because we don't want somebody's, uh, you know, missing one of the checks on the checklist to discount their ballot. You know, Emily, anything you want to add before? Um, I want to change gears a little bit because at least in my mind, and I, I realize as a reporter, I am probably a little more soapboxy about public records and open meeting laws than other people may be. But I do feel that when it comes to accessing government, the public's ability to access government and um, hold government accountable, elections, open meeting law and um, public document laws are a three legged stool. And they all need to be strong and healthy. And I'm curious, you know, one of the frustrations I've had with our right to know laws is I feel like in many ways they are so open and so transparent and really have that ethos. And yet it's very hard to hold people accountable who repeatedly defy them. Um, and so I'm curious for you, uh, Sarah, where where do you see um, the next step for strengthening our public meeting and public records laws? Can I be really uh, sort of explicit and example driven on this? So, sure. you know, I think this is probably true in multiple towns, um, but at least around here, we have sort of someone who's elected regularly that's sort of known regularly to defy open meeting laws on the regular in multiple positions they've been in. And it is like, it's also the kind of thing that's like sort of deep government geek in that like yeah. having voters know that about a candidate at a local election, have anyone care is not really enough. You know, like we can say that the ultimate accountability for any elected official is that they're not elected again. But again, you need so much information in voters' hands to make that actually real that we know that a lot of the time that doesn't work, especially in not particularly competitive elections. Um, and so like what what else can we do? Um, so it's, it's a it's a big topic. We could have used the entire hour to talk about this, um, but I will do my best at at diving in with some concrete um, suggestions and examples. Um, I think there's a, a couple of different levels that that I'll dive into this on. One is, you know, how does an average citizen uh, advocate for their right to know? Um, and so if whether it's petitioning your local government or or the legislature or some agency of uh, the state administration for information and feeling like you're not being given the information that you asked for, um, that really calls for uh, somebody who has more uh, expertise and uh, and more uh, authority to help. Uh, citizens access information. So I think having a public records ombudsperson or advocate um, would be a great place to start. And this could be, uh, you know, an office of, uh, of state government whose sole purpose is to help, uh, help navigate that public records process. Um, because at, th at the end of the day, a lot of times we see as many um, simple uh, omissions or oversights or accidents of, uh, of local government mm -hmm. officials as much as, um, as Emily was implying, as much as somebody who's sort of purposely flaunting. And system. I think that's what's so hard about it, Sarah, is mm -hmm. that like the laws are sort of complex. If you're just a volunteer entering state government and you don't realize that you can't reply all to an email, like that's one thing, right? And there's a lot of people who are sort of learning those roles. There's also the fact that public records requests have been weaponized in a few places as a way of sort of drowning state government and state officials. And I think that's happened to some of us in the legislature. Um, and so there's sort of those two, there's those two pieces of the dynamics. And then there's people who are sort of intentionally skirting the law and having someone who's able to discern between those sort of three paths and offer support with that discernment would be powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that that ombudsperson person or advocate could really, you know, be the role to help um, both the government agency 
um, some of those maybe volunteer local boards, uh, as well as the citizens' uh, right to know. You know, an example of um, of public records being weaponized uh, is is you know our legislative branch of government has a very tiny uh, legal staff, and uh, over the course of the last three years or so, we have lost almost one full entire staff person who has been sucked into the world of responding to records requests at a time when I think, Emily, you would probably agree, we have done more to open up the process of how we do our legislative business through uh, through improvements on our website so that you can search for the for the uh, testimony and the and the and the bill language and all of the documents supporting a particular bill, to the fact that we now stream on YouTube every single uh, committee meeting, every single floor session in the House and Senate, uh, and also uh, the the public caucuses that the different parties have are all available. Um, open and publicly. So you no longer have to be able to drive to Montpelier to follow what's going on um, or make, uh, you know, a request for somebody to burn a, a, you know, a CD of the audio of a, of a committee record. You can now go back and watch uh, the last two years of the legislature mm -hmm. on YouTube. Um, and so the, the, you know, the, the access to government really is, uh, it's critical there's more that we need to do to, to streamline it. Um, you know, I think public records exemptions are pretty numerous and convoluted and could mm -hmm. probably be streamlined. This is not something that a citizen legislature is going to be able to lead on its own. Um, a citizen legislature where we have a four and a half month session, and I know from leading the government operations committee that there are so many other issues that pop up in front of the government operations committee that are timely and have to be dealt with, that that citizen legislature really would not have the time to start from scratch in consolidating our public records laws. And so as a new secretary of state, I would work with other um, statewide elected officials to craft a proposal that we would then uh, give to the legislature and ask the legislature to enact. Uh, this is something that is going to take a lot of time and a lot of engagement with a, different levels of government so that we can put forward a proposal that gets things right. And, Thank you. Uh, and I think it's something that is perfectly um, legitimate for a statewide elected official to work on on behalf of the state of Vermont. I have often wanted, um, I, I sometimes wish that we had a public records, public meeting, um, separate committee, like like we do with some of our other legislation, like the cannabis board or, or that type of thing, because it is a little concerning that one of the bodies meant to be governed by these laws, the legislature is also the body that tends to craft um, the law and oversee it. And I have to admit, as a journalist, that is a concern of mine. I will just throw that little grenade out there. Mm -hmm. um, so I would love I to see an independent. An independent yeah. body. I yeah. think it's one of those things also that, um, you know, sort of everyone was riding on small town trust for a long time about. Mm -hmm. And I think this last um, governor's administration has really super tightened down um, the Hatches, batten, batten down the hatches. Batten down the hatches, batten yes. Batten down the hatches <laughs> on, um, on records requests, on access to government employees and on conversations, um, really like just tighter and tighter every year. And so there, I think there are more and more reasons we really need to open up that conversation. We are almost out of time. I wanna ask you quickly, Sarah, if you could enact a policy that would make Vermont work better for everybody, what would it be? Oh my gosh. I know. Across the realm of all policies. Isn't mm -hmm. that terrible? Not, not elections related? Me. Like, can no. I go outside of yeah. the Secretary yeah. of State's office? <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so I think the, I think one of the glaring um, uh, gaps in what we do in the state of Vermont, um, it was really uh, brought forward by the 
the pandemic, and that is that we should have uh, paid family and medical leave. Mm -hmm. um, that's not something that the Secretary of State's office has control over, but it's a bill that when I was uh, in the legislature, I, I sponsored it a couple times around. And as Emily said earlier, you know, it's something that the, the governor has vetoed. Um, we have uh, we have a missed opportunity here. We could have enacted um, paid family and medical leave, and that could have gone a long way to to helping to cushion the blow of quarantine and school closures and daycare closures. And how do you take care of a sick family member when you have to choose between going to work and caring for that sick family member? Um, so I wish that we had done this before the pandemic um, so that it would have been there uh, to support Vermont families. I think we probably would be seeing less in the way of workforce shortages if we'd had that kind and compassionate and automated system in place uh, to make sure that people don't have to choose between their health and their paycheck. Sarah, thank you. Uh, Sarah Copeland Hansas, uh, Secretary of State candidate. If people want to learn more about you and your um, uh, um, campaign, where can they find out more information? Uh, you can go to my website at sarahforvermont.com uh, and would love to actually have you follow uh, me on social media as well at Sarah, the number four not like the website, which is F-O-R. My social media handles is Sarah for Vermont. Um, and you can follow along on the campaign. You can send me a question. Would love to hear from you. And I will be getting out and around the state a lot in the next month. And so I look forward to seeing you. Thank you. And Emily, where can people find you? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org and you'll get links to all my socials and my email and my last few newsletters. And you can sign up to get more information there as well as every other Wednesday on the Brattleboro Common, I'm hosting Meet the Candidate events for statewide candidates that are coming down, coming through, sit down, talk to folks from Wyndham County and get to know us. Wonderful. And as always, you can find the Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station, every Friday at 2 p.m., as well as you find where you find your podcast, BCTV, and many of the PEG stations around Vermont. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Mm -hmm.